Hey guys, hope you're doing well and are excited to get back to learning about microeconomics and hope you're ready to start with a brand new topic of how producers behave. So we've talked over the last 15 to 20 videos about how consumers behave. Now we're going to look at the other side of the equation in an economy or in a country and look at how producers behave, right? So because there's no country where you only have consumers and no producers. So we're going to use, and I'm going to use this example throughout this, uh, this chapter. Uh, I'm going to assume that you are running a bakery uh, in which you are you know, selling cakes and all pastries and everything else. And you're, you know, I'm going to use these pictures over and over again. So think about now, so, uh, until now you've thought about consumers. You've thought of yourself as consumers. Now from here on till the next you know, probably 15, 20 videos, you're going to be thinking yourself as a producer. So if you're a producer, you're going to have to produce something and you're going to be incurring some costs. Right? So we're going to look at this example. So you, you, know, you might have certain inputs that you have to hire. Uh, which are going to be costing you something. So we're going to talk about cost in this chapter, uh, in, in, in this video and, and the you know, next few videos as well. And then you're going to get a certain output for which you're going to get revenue. So you're going to incur costs to buy inputs. Your inputs can be labor, people that you have to hire, raw materials, uh, land, uh, you know, paying rent on your, uh, on your building, whatever it is, those are all costs you have to incur. Then you take those inputs and you produce something and then you sell it to the public. And then you get revenue from that. So that's the... Uh, equation where you know producers are going to uh, operate by. So that's what we're going to analyze. So I'll get back to this picture, but I'm going to ask you a question, and you should pause the video and think about it, and then answer it. Let's say you run a local bakery. List two different kinds of costs, and we'll talk about costs a lot more in the next few videos. Think about two costs that you see in that picture, and I'll go back to the previous picture. And based on that, think about two decisions you might have to make uh, based on those costs. So I'll go back to that picture and pause it and answer those questions and then come back to the video. So as you can see, you might have to hire a person to help you run the business. So you have a cost of labor. You have to buy inputs. You know, if you're making, if you're making cakes in a bakery, uh, you're going to have to buy some flour. You might have to get some milk, eggs, sugar, lots of other things. Those are your raw materials. Those are your inputs that you need to be able to produce the final product. Then you have to pay for electricity, right? So you're going to have utilities that you have to pay for. You might have to, you know, if you own the building, you'll have to buy the land. If you're renting the building, you'll have to pay rent or lease on the building. So all of these are examples of costs that this owner is going to have to incur. And the hope is that you sell the good to the public at a higher price than what it's costing you and thereby making a profit. So we'll talk a lot more about all of these, you know, we'll categorize these different costs. But hopefully you, you have at least some understanding of costs in this example. And then the two decisions that you can make based on these costs is if your business is booming, you might want to, depending on the lease or, or you know, how expensive it is to buy land, uh, you might want to open up another store. Or if labor is more expensive and machines are much cheaper, then you might want to reduce the number of people you hire and get more machines. So there are lots of decisions you can make or you have to make uh, uh, based on the costs that you have to incur. So in this video and in the next few videos, uh, the chapter that we'll be covering, we're going to talk about costs a lot and then how does the uh, producer decide how much to produce based on those costs. All right. So total revenue, we already introduced you to that concept in the previous video in, in when we talked about consumer behavior. It's the price you charge for the good times how many units you sell. That's how much you bring in when you sell those cakes and pastries. Costs is referring to, so TC is just total cost, and we will, over the next few videos, uh, categorize costs into different kinds of costs as well, is the market value of all the inputs that you use to produce the output. So in our example, you had you know, uh, raw materials like milk and flour, labor, like a person you want to hire to help you out, or a cashier, uh, the lease on the building, the machines you're buying, uh, all of those things are cost, all right? And we'll categorize them. So the amount a firm must pay to produce a given level of output Q refers to the output that you're going to sell, and inputs are what is going to what you need to be able to sell and sorry produce and sell those goods. All right, uh, so those your inputs are also sometimes referred to as factors of production because those are the factors you need to be able to produce an output. So what you pay those factors if you hire a person to help you out, you pay them salary or wages. If you're renting a building, you pay rent. Uh, if you're buying or borrowing money to you know, buy machines and equipment, then you have to pay interest on that. So all of these are ways you pay the inputs that you're hiring to produce a given level of output. So a production function, which is a very important concept, gives the relationship between the inputs you're getting and the outputs that they are producing for you. 
So the production function shows the relationship between the quantity of input that you're going to be using and then the corresponding output that those quantities of input give you. All right, so for example, if you hire 10 units of labor, if you get 10 workers, which again, you're not gonna get for a bakery, but you know, just using an example, how much more will they produce in terms of cakes? Or if you buy eight more machines, how much more will those machines produce? Or if you get more land or lease another building, how much more output can you produce? So these questions can be answered using the concept of production function, which gives the relationship, and we'll graph it in, in today's video as well, relationship between inputs and output that you're going to produce. All right, so moving forward, uh, so the production function or a graphical representation is going to look at the same combination of uh, output and inputs. Again, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat all the inputs uh, over and over again. These are basic categorizations of all the inputs you're gonna get to get your uh, corresponding output. So a couple of assumptions before I draw the, uh, the production function out or something related to the production function. We assume that the inputs are being used efficiently. So the combination of inputs that you are using to produce a given level of output is efficient. All right? uh, the production function is going to define for any given level of technology. So the technology available to produce cakes or whatever good you're producing is going to be fixed when we're looking at this combination of inputs and output. Because if you improve technology, the same person will become more productive which we'll address later on. And like I said, that inputs are sometimes referred to as factors of production as well. So here's a numerical example. So let's say you have two inputs. You have input one, you can think of input one as labor or anything, and input two, which let's say is raw materials, right? It can be a skilled worker and an unskilled worker. So you might have skilled and unskilled labor, you might have raw materials labor, you might have any combination of two inputs. So if you are, this row here, this column here corresponds to how many X1 you're hiring, and this, row here corresponds to how many x2 you're hiring. And then this grid here represents total output produced for a given uh, level of x1 and x2 combination. So for example, if you hire zero x1 and zero x2, you will produce zero output. If you hire one unit of an x1 input and two units of x2 input, you will produce three. And if you hire two units of x1 and two units of x2, you will produce more. So you can see that as you hire more input, you will produce more output. How much more we'll get into uh, in, in a couple of videos, uh, that's a very important question, and if you are thinking about that already, that's very good, uh, because it's a very important question, but this is just saying the relationship between inputs and how output that we're going to be producing. Now let's graph it uh, numerically. Isoquant, which is a concept that's very important, and I'll describe it in just a second, is the set of all possible combinations of the two inputs that yield the same maximum output. So for example, if I go back a slide, so an isoquant is, if you're looking at output of three, you can get to an output of three by hiring two units of x1 and one unit of x2, sorry, or you can also get to the same output by hiring two units of x2 and only one unit of x1 in terms of inputs. So that's what we represent on one isoquant. All right, so it is, and I'll draw it out, it is all possible levels of uh, uh, inputs that yield the same output. And if you've studied the consumer side of uh, what we've done in the last few videos, this should seem familiar in terms of what we are drawing here, but a, a different concept. So now we have x1 and x2, which are not output, these are inputs. So when we talked about consumer behavior, X1 and X2 were two goods we were buying. When we talk about producers, we're looking at two inputs a producer is buying to be able to produce a given level of output. So an isoquant, I'll draw it out and then, then I'll explain it. An isoquant, let me say this corresponds to a level of output of Q1. So if you want to, and I'll just give it a number, if you want to produce three units of output, you can either hire three units of X2 and one unit of X1, or you can also get the same output of three units from one unit of x2 and two units of x1. Now these numbers don't correspond to the previous example, I'm just making it up, uh, but it's just to give, explain what, what I'm trying to do here. So an isoquant represents all different combinations of x1 and x2 that yield the same output. Now if you want to get more output, then obviously you're going to want to either hire more of both x1 or x2, or hire more of at least one input. So if you are hiring three units of x2, and you want to produce five units of output, you're going to 
need to get more of x1. So as the isocons that move in the rightward direction, would what that implies is that you're producing more output. But what that also means is you're going to have to get more inputs, either more of one input or more of both inputs. So a couple of things about an isoquant is an isoquant will always be negatively sloped. And that's because we are keeping the amount of output we are producing along an isoquant constant. So if you want to produce the same output, but you want to change the mix of inputs, if you buy more of certain inputs, you, will, you can give up some of the other input to get the same exact output. And the second thing is they never touch the axis. And the assumption we make about that is that both x1 and x2 are necessary. So you cannot produce the good with, with zero units of either x1 or x2. So if that's the case, then they will, you know, they'll be downward sloping, but they'll never touch either of the two axes. So that's what isoquant represents, is all different combinations of inputs that will yield the same output along a particular isoquant. So if you're thinking, I've seen something like this before, you're not wrong. When we studied the behavior of consumers, we talked about indifference curves. It had a very similar feel to what we're talking about here, but it was relating to the consumers. So you know, if you did guess that this looks like indifference curves, that's very good. Uh, you're paying uh, good attention in, in my videos. So that's what isoquants are. So in today's video, we, I've introduced you to how producers behave. And very simply put, we looked at what are the costs Right? You have to incur certain costs to buy inputs, and then you have to use those inputs to produce an output which will yield revenue. So all we've talked about is production function, which is if I get more inputs, how much more output will that person or that input give me? And then in the next video, we'll talk in, in, in a lot more detail about the different kinds of costs, and also get back to you know, production function and talk about it in a little more in depth. So hopefully you are getting motivated about the producer side of the, of the whole microeconomics uh, as you were in the consumer side, and we'll proceed with this topic in the next video.